Hi, I'm Mark Dwyer. I'm the co-chair of the uh, Southeast Iowa Sierra Club, and I'm really delighted to interview to introduce the speakers today. We have some fabulous speakers, and we have fabulous people doing fabulous things in this town, and I consider the people that we're going to be introducing to be community assets. Uh, and our first speaker is Dr. John Eichert. He's going to be talking about developing a food utility. And for those of you who don't know, Dr. Eichert is a professor emeritus at the University of Missouri at Columbia. He's a celebrated agricultural economist. He's an author and a public advocate for economic sustainability. He's an outspoken critic of industrial agriculture, even though he first worked in private industry before dedicating over 30 years to teaching in various university settings. Dr. Eichert is a prolific writer and a publisher of numerous papers and five books, including Sustainable Capitalism and the Essentials of Economic Sustainability. Since he retired in 2000, Dr. Eichert spends his time writing and speaking internationally. He advocates for a paradigm shift to economic sustainability that moves away from an endless accumulation of more cheap stuff and toward valuing protecting valuing and protecting the unique human and natural characteristics of communities. Dr. Eichert is also a member of the Jefferson County Farmers and Neighbors Incorporated Board of Directors, and I give you Dr. John Eichert. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. I didn't, we came in, we had this up here. I didn't know I was going to be the poster boy, but I've learned when you walk into a room and you're depending on equipment and it's working, don't mess with it. If you sh shut it down, it may never come back up. So, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. And I want to talk about the concept of what I call community food utilities. So we talk about eliminating local hunger. And the first thing, you, if you haven't looked at the slide, you might ask, well, what does hunger have to do with Earth Day? Well, I think ultimately what we're talking about, and we've heard a lot about, is sustainability, but those of us that take sustainability seriously, what it means is it means how do we meet the needs of the present, meaning all of us in the present, and how do we do it in such a way that we don't diminish or compromise opportunities for those to come in the future. And I don't think there's any need that's more pressing than the need for good food. And when you think about it, how can you expect a mother who has hungry children to be concerned about climate change, fossil energy depletion, uh, species extinction, and these long-term factors if we aren't meeting the needs of the present, particularly the needs for good food? And that's what I want to talk about today. Food insecurity is defined by USDA, or we might call it hunger, is defined as uh, a lack of consistent access to enough food to, for active, healthy lifestyles. That's the way they would define it. If we look at the situation where we are today, the latest statistics on food insecurity show that one in seven children are food insecure, about 14% live in food insecure households, and overall it's about one in nine. And in fact, these figures are lower, and during the pandemic, actually food insecurity really didn't go up all that much because of the generous government programs that came out that provided subsidies and so people continue to get food. In Jefferson County, we're pretty much on par with the overall country, a little bit better off for Jefferson County, at least the last figures I saw. But we still got like one in eight children or 12% of our children in this county live in food insecure homes and about one out of 10 or 10% of the people are faced with food insecurity. If we look at the realities of hunger in America, we have more Americans today that are classified as food insecure than we did back in the 1960s. When CBS did the documentary Hunger in America back in 1968, the best estimates at that time were about 10 million people were classified as food insecure or hungry at that time. That was about 5% of the population. We have more people today that are classified as severely food insecure than we had back in the 1960s classified as being hungry. And in addition to that, we've got an epidemic of diet-related diseases, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, a whole range of cancers, in particular on the children that are affected more than anyone else by many of these problems that have to do with hunger today. Hunger is what we economists call a market failure. A market failure is something that needs to be done for the greater good of society that markets simply are incapable of doing. You see, the problem is, is that markets are, are impersonal. 
Markets are kind of transactions that are made, they're impersonal transactions that are made to money. And people, the markets respond to money and not to necessity. When you talk about, okay, what's the demand for food? It's not the people that need food, it's the people that have the money and are willing to able to compete with other opportunities for the food so that they can get enough food for their families and get enough food for themselves. So hunger is a market failure, but hunger is also a public policy failure. There's been a recognition ever since the enclosures back in the 1600s that when you, once you go to where you commodify the land and you, you leave it in a situation where people don't have access to land to produce food for themselves, then you always have a significant number of people in every population that were unable to earn enough money economically to buy enough good food for themselves. And so the early 1600s, 1602, were the English Poor Laws, which were the first laws that would come in that was trying to address the market failure of hunger. And in the United States, we had the food stamp programs. The early food stamp programs were targeted trying to get rid of agricultural assets rather than actually feed people. But during the 1960s, then we opened it up, and food stamps and food security programs and food assistance was not limited to agricultural surpluses, but recognized that the markets were not going to feed hungry people. And so it was continued to, since then with the, with the food stamp program and government food security programs that tried to feed people. But as you saw, we still have high levels of food insecurity and high levels of hunger in the country. Charities are necessary and will always be there. But charities will never eliminate systemic hunger within society. As we saw in the, during the pandemic, the charities stepped up. That's one reason we didn't have more hungry people and more starving people than we had. The charities stepped in. Charities will always be needed for individual emergencies as well as national emergencies, but they can't solve the problem of systemic hunger. Hunger typically is associated with what I called before, poverty. People who simply can't enough earn, earn enough money to buy enough food and the failure of government programs to offset that. But even if we can't eliminate poverty, even if we can't eliminate the fact that people, there's always going to be people that can't earn enough money, then hunger is not a necessity. Hunger is discretionary in the world that we live in today because there's more than enough food produced in the United States and actually more than enough food produced in the world to feed everybody a wholesome, healthy diet. We just aren't getting it to the people that need it the most. So I contend that it's time to try something different. You may think, well, I've spent a long time here getting down to the point, but it's time to try something different because the things that we've been trying for the last 450 years haven't worked. So it's time to try something else, I think. We just continue doing the same thing we've been doing. We're probably going to get the same thing we've been getting. We're going to end up with a lot of hungry kids. And I think it's inexcusable in a country you know, that has as fluent as we are, the richest country in the world, that we have even one in ten of our children lead in food insecure homes. And back in the, 2008, 2009, it was up to one in five. Twenty percent of our kids were food insecure. It's time to try something different. And I think the logical place to start is at the local level. Because the problem is, as I said before, our markets are impersonal. They don't respond to need. And their government programs have become impersonal as well. We have a whole set of rules and regulations you have to follow to decide who's eligible for which particular program, and the people have to apply for the program. And so it doesn't respond to individual needs. It's whole classes of things, and there's a whole lot of people that are being left out. And we need to get down to the personal level where people know each other and care about each other. And that's what I've said that we need to try to, to do something at the personal level, and that's where the community food utility comes in. And I've suggested that we use kind of the concept of a public utility to provide sort of a conceptual or legal umbrella within which we can ensure that everybody has enough good food. And that's what I want to talk about here today. You know, a lot of times when you start talking about moving away from relying on markets for something addressing hunger or any other issue, you get accused of being a socialist or a communist or something like this. You say, well, we've got to leave it to the market. But if you look out here, we don't just leave our electricity or gas or our sewers or transportation, whatever. We have public utilities, which we provide those services because we've concluded that everybody has a right to have access to you know, uh, natural gas or heat or electricity or various other services such as public transportation. And so we provide them through a concept of public utilities. 
Public utilities are, are appropriate for any kind of market failure. As I said, hunger is a market failure. Some of the other market failures that I've experienced and you, you've experienced as well overall, when I was growing up on a farm out in the country down in southwest Missouri, we didn't have electricity. We didn't have electricity, so we didn't have running water, so you didn't have an electric pump to go with it either. Do you know why we didn't have electricity? It simply didn't make any economic sense for the electric companies to run power lines down those roads where it was just sparsely populated by a farmer here and a farmer there. Back in those days, you know, our electric bill was probably, might have been a 50 cents or a dollar a month or something like that because all we really had was light bulbs and the toaster maybe and a refrigerator once we got electricity. But anyway, it didn't make any sense. So what did they do? The government's put together a program called Rural Electric Association. We had come in and the rural electric cooperatives were given the opportunity then. They could hire local people to go out and set the poles and string the lines and hire local people and train them how to wire our houses. And they did it at a fraction of the cost that it would have been done for the, the big utility companies. But they come in and we had electricity. Now, when you have a public utility, it doesn't mean that it's something where everybody's left out like we were with electricity. When you have public transportation, most people can't afford to have a car or pay, pay whatever it takes for a taxi or something else, but you have some people in the community then that can't afford an essential service. So in that case, you bring in public transportation for those people that can't afford to do it on their own, and that's where we are with hunger. We need to recognize that hunger is a market failure and we have to deal with it like we do other market failures. So what would a community food utility, what would it be about? It would say, okay, what's the purpose of this utility? To ensure that everyone in this community has enough good, wholesome food to meet their basic nutritional needs for active, healthy lifestyles. That's what I call nutritional food security, not just calories, but nutrition. And it says, that's the function of this utility. Just like we're going to provide electricity for everyone, we're going to provide transportation for everyone that needs it, we're going to provide um, gas going into the house for everyone that needs it. If they need food, then we're going to make sure that they have it. And we can do, do it by leveraging existing funds that are already allocated. One reason I've suggested this is, you know, as a public utility, we already recognize that hunger is something that requires public funding. That's the reason we have government food assistance programs. Taxpayer dollars that we approve and year after year a big part of the USDA budget goes for the food security program. So it's already approved. So what I'm saying is we could take those funds and leverage those funds most efficiently by bringing it into the local level where you take the funding that goes into the SNAP programs and other food assistance programs and make it totally voluntary the people that are eligible for those funds can decide whether or not they want to join the utility or whether they want to continue to get it the way they are now. It goes into the utility. You provide the food, make it accessible by a number of means, whether it's local fresh markets or food markets or, or everybody eats restaurants or which are popular in some places or whether it's food boxes that go into the homes or whatever. But you want to provide everybody with good food. And you can personalize the program. You can recognize at the local level where you actually know the people and can get to know the people involved, whether people that need food brought into their homes as couples, whether it's individuals you know that need somebody to take care of them or, or to get the food specifically for them or large families or small families or whatever it is, then you can assure that everybody gets food that fits what their particular needs are. You can minimize the cost of the program overall by focusing on raw, minimally processed food, food that's really healthy. And you can see what we're, how much we can leverage in here because what the farm level gets or what the farmer gets for what we spend for food amounts to less than 15% or 15 cents out of each dollar we spend for food is for the actual food itself. You can't eliminate all of that, but with raw, by local uh, raw, minimally processed food, a lot of that, 85% goes into the processing, transportation, advertising, promotion, a whole range of other things that we don't really have to have and it adds nothing in terms of retuition. If we're going to do that, then we have to deal with the whole system. We have to deal with the whole person. We have to recognize that a lot of people don't know how to select good food. They don't know how to prepare good food. It's not telling them what to eat, not telling them how to prepare it, but it's empowering people providing with education assistance that would enable members of the community to select and purchase their own food. It wouldn't just include how to cook food or recipes, but we'd have to make sure that people had the cooking facilities in their home, had the storage facilities and things of this nature. And you just help people 
become food secure by working with the whole person rather than just developing a program or giving them money. Economic suits, we can provide economic security for people within the local communities, for the farmers. Local farmers, you can communicate with those. I've talked about the idea of a vertical cooperative where the farmers, the producers, the local processors and, and customers, the people who receive the food are all involved in the process. But just like the other public utilities, you could say to farmers that are going to produce food, wholesome, wholesome, nutritious food in a sustainable kind of process that will pay you cost of production plus a reasonable return on your investment, just like the big corporate utilities do today when they're acquiring coal or any other input. They pay the supplier what it takes plus a reasonable return on investment for the process and you could provide the economic foundation then with government food assistance funds to build local food systems. It starts with the basic idea that we say access to good food for anybody that's willing to cooperate in the process. Access to good food is a basic human right. It's not something to be left to the market at the discretion of people if they want to do it or not do it. A responsible community says it's our responsibility of those people within the community that have the means to do so to ensure that basic food, good nutritious food, is a basic human right. There's a whole food sovereignty movement that's premised on that idea that good, culturally appropriate, healthful food is a basic human right to everyone. There's a local global food sovereignty movement. There's a local food sovereignty movement, U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance within this country that's supported with a lot of different organizations. It's the basic idea that was included in the Pope's encyclical on climate change or care of our common home where he talked about we don't have two problems, a separate problem, an environmental, ecological problem, and a social or an, or an economic inequity problem. It's the one problem. It's the same problem, and we won't solve one until we solve the other. The Green New Deal says right up front, it's the responsibility of the U.S. government to ensure for all people of this and current ge future generations access to good food, to a healthful food, a clean environment, a wholesome environment, uh, clean water, a whole range of basic rights that it's a responsibility of the government to do it. You can't do that at the federal level at this point. We don't have the political will, but you could do it in your own community. We can do things in our own community that we can't do yet at the local level. So community food sovereignty is also based on the principle that people have a basic right to determine their own food system, to decide what kind of food that they want produced and how they want it produced. And what I say here is a voluntary program for people that want to join that, then you have the food sovereignty. You have the right to reject whatever the corporations now are taking into the low-income communities and selling them junk food, whether it's in the convenience stores or whether it's in the liquor stores or whether it's food, the fast food restaurants, you can simply say the community food utility isn't going to provide that food because it's not healthful. If you want to eat junk food, that's fine. Don't join it. But what we're going to do is provide everybody with good food that wants good food. Food sovereignty is not self-sufficiency. You can decide within the community how much you want to depend upon local foods, how much you can get, whether you want to get it directly from farmers, local food hubs, farm to school programs, or it wants to be organic or other food. The basic thing is to ensure that everybody has access to good, nutritious, healthful food. You can start out within a community and you don't have to be self-sufficient. You can integrate with other communities and network with other communities and that's the way you change the whole system. That's the way we change state and federal laws. We prove that something can work in one community and that spreads to another community and those communities work together and network together so that you can have regional, bio-regional processing distribution kind of systems that are still rooted within the local communities where people know each other and they care about each other. I'll just end on this. This is a lady called Dory Robinson out of Richmond, California. I've shared a couple of programs with her. We shared a keynote address at an Eco Farm Conference in California. Dory Robinson works with people in the other cities of Richmond, California. They had, a, they had an abandoned railway line that run right through the city of Richmond. She was able to get access to that for the local people. They turned that whole railway line into a string of gardens and orchards and greenhouses. And it was the people within the community that did it. Dory Robbins says just giving people money isn't the answer. Just giving people food isn't the answer. You have to empower people. Empower people to produce their own food and to control their own destiny. And that's what a community food utility would be about. Like managing the commons. The local people decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. They set the rules. They enforce the rules. As long as they make sure it's hurts the public good in terms of making sure that everybody has enough good food. Dory Robinson says, hunger is not a necessity, it's not inevitable. Hunger, people are hungry today 
simply because we don't care enough to change the way we do things. We can meet the needs, the food needs of all in the present, and we can do it without diminishing opportunities for the future if we care enough to change the way we do things. Thank you very much. So, just a, a simple question. How would we start making this idea operational here? We've got some good things going. How do we, what are some steps that you can imagine that we can do? Well, the thing I've said, uh, you know, what we have to do, what you have to have to do to make this something like this work is you have to have a champion for that idea because you've got to sell it to the various people that are involved. You've got to explain to people that are involved all the way from the city council to the state board that deals with the community or deals with public utilities to uh, the local farmers and people of that nature. You have to have somebody that brings those together. And that takes a person that has a a commitment to the community and a commitment to getting people to work together over the long run to make it work. And then you've got to have a local government that kind of is willing to provide sort of the legal structure within this can what that within this could happen, you know, where it could happen. If you if you don't have a supportive side of structure in terms of the local public utility, then you don't have the shield from the marketplace so you can get in and do all the things that I'm talking about. But it takes someone with a long-term commitment with energy and that sort of thing, and then you have to believe in the idea. And I ultimately, I'm convinced that it has to be run by people within the local community. It can't be imposed on them by a handful of people from the outside. It has to be people within the community that says, this is the way that we get things done, and we're willing to take control of it, and we're willing to manage it so that it serves the public good. So I think that's what it takes.